Hello, I'm Dave Goldberg, and today I'd like to share a few thoughts on creative interdisciplinarity in a disciplinary world. It's fairly clear that we live in fast-paced times. Um, some have called it a creative era, and clearly the advance of knowledge has taken place at a, a staggering pace, uh, and this is being augmented and accelerated by information technology. But it's also clear that in the university, uh, our institutional uh, capability and information systems have not kept pace with, with this, these changes. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the historical and uh, conceptual forces that are uh, pushing change. And then that will help us think about both the institutional and IT needs of this creative era. And the way we're going to do that is uh, first we're going to talk about uh, the world being flat and all that. Then we'll talk about moving from uh, the Cold War to our creative times and some of the missed revolutions along the way. We'll talk about the techno-economics of now and then we'll also talk about how we can uh, uh, promote interdisciplinarity in a disciplinary world. And we'll finish up by talking about uh, lessons from and, and for the I, IT landscape to help promote creative interdisciplinarity. Now we're going to do this in, in um, uh, three short tapes and we'll start and basically set the, uh, the framework uh, for one way of thinking about our times. While many have asserted that uh, the world is, is flat, that we live in essentially uh, very creative times and that returns to creativity are increasing, especially in the developed world. And there are many examples of, uh, of that, of course. Uh, Tom uh, Friedman coined the, the famous phrase, the world is, is flat. Uh, others have joined, have joined in. Richard Florida uh, talks about the rise of the, uh, the creative class. And, and Dan Pink says, you need a whole new mind to deal with our creative times. Um, and we're not going to uh, look at, at, that, at any of these in, in detail, but we want to get the broad sweep of where we've come from and where we are to understand what it is that we might do institutionally and informationally. So that c will cause us to go back and take a little bit of a look at the Cold War and the origins of the modern research university. Now, we're living in, in a, an era uh, whose die was cast uh, at the end of World War II um, by an electrical engineer named Vannevar Bush who headed the Office of Scientific Research and Development. And his report, uh, Science the Endless Frontier, led to funding of what we now recognize as the National Science Foundation. And many of the habits of the modern university were, uh, were formed uh, in the crucible of these times. Uh, curriculum funding, promotion and tenure, and so forth. Um, and these things uh, and, and these changes were appropriate in many ways to what was then a very hierarchical and specialized industrial and governmental world. Um, and universities followed suit with uh, even stronger disciplinary ties and stronger departments and more hierarchy than they'd had previously. Now along the way, some things have happened and, and industry and, and, and uh, the organizational world outside the university has largely changed in response to technological and economic forces. Uh, but the, the university has in some ways missed those revolutions. We teach about those revolutions, but we don't, we don't adopt their practices as part of what we do. So for example, the quality revolution that, that, revo that, that changed industry and the, and the way uh, manufactured goods are produced um, has largely been missed in the academy, even though we teach classes about it. The entrepreneurial revolution um, uh, shaped in, in Silicon Valley and then propagated around the world is one that we teach about, but we don't practice. And then the IT revolution is one that continues to shape our world today, and yet um, we have IT of, of a sort, but IT practices are not integrated into the fabric of the university in the same way that they are at Dell Computer or, uh, or Walmart, where uh, supply chain IT uh, drives those, those organizations. So we teach these things, but we don't necessarily uh, practice them. Now, to understand um, 
the importance of, uh, of these things and how they help shape the institutions that we live in. It, um, uh, we can uh, take a, a page out of Karl Marx's playbook and look at the technological and economic forces that are um, helping to shape things. And certainly transportation, um, improved transportation over the course of the 20th century um, from the automobile and, and steam locomotives to, um, to uh, 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 jet engines and rocket ships um, are, um, uh, are, are a, a, a signature of the change in transport technology to the change in communications technology from, uh, from uh, the telegraph, the telephone, to uh, the internet. And these things have important effects from an economic point of view because they, they do two things. They reduce the transaction costs, that is the costs of using the free market are reduced when we have, have lower transport and lower communication costs. And they also reduce, uh, they also um, re improve returns to network effects. So as more and more people use a network, it becomes uh, uh, more valuable. And so these things have helped shape the world that we live in in important, um, uh, important ways. And, and now we live in a world of small, agile organizations connected by uh, these, these vastly improved communication and transportation networks. Now, what does this mean for our creative times? Well, it means that when, when we hear about organizations sticking to their knitting or their core competence, that's largely a reflection of, of these economic and technological uh, forces. But what it, what it really does is it helps make it easy for disparate people to act um, at a distance. And so this is, this is almost a perfect recipe for creative action at a distance. So to use Arthur Kessler's term, we can think of the bisociation between different disciplines creating new disciplines um, with almost reckless, reckless abandon. But we live in organizations that largely owe their structure going back to the Renaissance, um, or even, even really uh, b bef um, before that to the Middle Ages. And so universities uh, trace their existence from the Middle Ages into the uh, disciplinary times of the uh, 1800s and 1900s. And so it's, I have sometimes uh, said that it, it sometimes it must feel, it must be at the university like it was in, in Renaissance um, uh, Italy with battling ci city-states, um, warring the warring factions of uh, Venice, uh, Rome, and Florence, the Doge in, in, in Venice and the Pope in Rome um, uh, fighting for um, uh, the, the Medicis in, in Florence, fighting for treasure and loyalty of their, their citizens. And so sometimes that's the way it feels with our strong departments and colleges as, 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 uh, as separate uh, uh, dots on the landscape. We'll return to um, the importance of allocating treasure uh, well um, in, in a later discussion. But for now, we'll, we'll, we'll close and we'll return um, to what some of the keys are in creating a, uh, uh, a more interdisciplinary university by focusing on human, net, human networks next.